Morning, Hillside. There we go. All right. Good morning, our online viewers. Uh, I'm Pastor Bill. And um, so, so our first, first week in Advent, Advent, and uh, we're going to talk about hope. Uh, we have our, our hope candle lit here. Um, what is hope, really? Um, well, it, it's the loss of any confidence. It's the loss of faith. It was um, early one morning on, on a Friday, and uh, we'd gotten to the, the put-in at, at the Upper Yacht, which is a, a Class 5 river in Maryland. And I was there with uh, my buddy Joe Buck, uh, Pat Z, and Robbie. And Robbie was the one uh, calling the strokes that day. And so um, if you're calling strokes, um, you're the captain, right? You do what the captain says, uh, the stroke caller. So we got on the river. We got ready to go on the river. And uh, it was already running at, at like 4-1. And at 4-2, no one's allowed to be on there. Now, the thing was, um, the river hadn't caught up with the watershed yet. It was already high, and when all the water finally gets in there and there's streams along the way, it's going to be a lot higher than 4-1. So Robbie said, hey, look, you know, this is a deal. Uh, do we want to do it or not? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it, man, because, you know, you're not allowed to do it. So, hey, it's forbidden fruit or whatever, right? And uh, Joe and, and Pat Z went along, and, and we get on the river, and um, well, we wipe out bad, like, in the first big rapid. I mean, it just sucks the boat right out from under us, and there's a, a lot of aggressive self-rescue going on there. <laughs> Get back on the boat, and everybody's kind of shook up. And we, we wipe out again, because the river was so high, it made ledges where there weren't ledges before. And I know we got pinned under a ledge, and, and, and Joe Buck was like under the waterfall where it comes under, you know? And he's like there, and he can't breathe, and he's reaching out. And I'm on the other end of the boat, and, and, and Robbie and, and Pat, I don't know what happened to them. Uh, they got washed out somewhere. I'm on the other end of the boat, and I'm weighing it down because I don't want the boat to flip. And Joe's reaching, and I'm like trying to reach for him, and Robbie comes out of nowhere. I guess he's aggressively self-rescued to the side, ran up, jumped, and he pulled Joe out. But, but, but something happened to Joe. Um, man, it stole his hope, you know. Uh, Pat was, well, Pat was done after the first one. But um, we get to a point uh, later on down the river where um, you can short rope up the side of the canyon and, and hike out. And, uh, you know, Robbie's like, Pat, you got to go, man. Um, there's a trail up there. We'll meet you at the takeout. And so we, we got Pat out because he was just, he was too scared to paddle anymore. All right. He just, he'd, he'd lost all hope during the first time. Joe, it, it took a succession of, and, and, and Joe was like, well, hey, you know what? I'm not much good here. And, and he starts tearing up a little bit. I'm going to die here. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, I should leave too. And Robbie's like, well, quit whining, you'll be all right. <laughs> and we get back on there, and, and we did. We, uh, we navigated the rest of the river fine, but it was a succession, right, of mishaps, a succession of unfortunate events, right, that, that took all hope. Um, if you live in, in Cedar Rapids, right, we have seen since March, a succession of unfortunate things. Coronavirus, derecho, um, that threatens to steal our hope. It threatens to bring bitterness in. And when bitterness comes, hope leaves. It, it destroys it. We see this displayed in, uh, in this word today. So if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to open up to uh, Exodus 15. And we're going to look at verses 22 to 27. Um, what do we do when hope turns to bitterness? How do we get it back? That's what we're going to look at. So it should be up on the screen. I'm reading the New King James Version. It might be different up there. I don't know. I can't see it. <laughs> so, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And that's the verse we're kind of 
going to hover on today, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, there were, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this word. It is rich. Lord, there's so much here. But it's viable today. We see so much of you in here and so much of your desire for us. Help us, Lord, to see it. Help us, Lord, to hear it. Help us, Lord, to put it to work. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We invite you here. We need you here. Come and fill this house. Fill our hearts. And just, you run this show. As always, I, I pray not to give a good message here, Lord, but a message that does some good for your kingdom, Lord, for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's get to work. So what is it about bitter? All right. The, the water being bitter. It, it means a couple things. It, it really does. Um, so if it's in the same place that we think it is today, there are wells there or springs there um, that are bitter. There's a compound in the water that makes it salty and gives it a, a really bad aftertaste. Now, the thing is, you can drink this water. It's not so salty. It's going to make you sick or delirious. In fact, the nomads that live there, they will let their camels drink it, though sparingly. Um, so it wasn't that it was undrinkable. It just tasted bad. Um, so it, it was bitter, but not undrinkable. Now, the rabbis teach that, that this is more of an allegory or a parable that, that was kind of lived out. Um, in fact, if you read the text in the original language, um, they were bitter could describe the Israelites or the water. Their contention is they couldn't drink the water because they, the Israelites, were bitter. Well, I want to look at that for a minute because it doesn't even say here that they tasted the water, does it? No, it just says they couldn't drink it because it was bitter. Um, so if we look back and we look at this in context, right? Exodus 1.14 says that, that the Egyptians made their lives bitter with harsh work, working with, with, with mud and mortar and brick. So th they started out bitter. Th they really did. In Exodus 12.8, the first Passover, it says that they, they, they had um, bitter greens that they ate with the meat, with the, with the lamb, to remind them of the bitterness of Egypt. Now, this was four days later, four days after the Passover, um, and the life that they knew was completely different. Everything was different now. I mean, in Egypt, they, they at least had a bed they didn't have to move each day, right? Um, they, they could escape out of the sun. Um, there was some sort of, of normalcy. It wasn't uh, 10 hours of marching each day, um, and they had some water at least. Now that th there was none, they'd been three days without water. And, th and they get to this, um, to this pool, th this well, and the water's bitter. Um, now, you can drink it, right? I remember uh, reading a documentary or reading a, a book about the USS Indianapolis. And if you don't know, um, that was the ship that was sunk after they had dropped the bomb uh, off to be uh, dropped on, on Japan. On their way back from dropping it off, because this mission was secret, um, they got hit by a torpedo, and men ended up in the water, a lot of sailors in the water, trained sailors who were trained not to drink that water, seawater, because it would make you delirious, it could kill you, it make you sick. Um, yet, after about a day or two of thirst, some of them started drinking it, because they were that thirsty. They said, if you swim down 10 feet, it's not salty anymore, you can, you can drink it, and they said it, and a couple other people started drinking it. These people, after three days in, in the desert, they couldn't drink the water or they wouldn't drink the water because it was bitter. What's the difference here? The difference is that the, the sailors had some hope of being rescued. Their hope wasn't gone. The Israelites here had let bitterness take over their hope. There's an old saying. It, it goes, uh, you are what you see. You see bitter water, you're bitter. And you see what you are. And, and I know this sounds illogical, but, but let me put this in a different kind of context. We've all known that person, and I'm sure none of you are here, um, who, when they get in a funk, all right, 
There is nothing in this world that will please them. Right? You can't do anything to get them out of that funk. They see everything through, through the uh, dark colored glasses. Um, you've, we've all known the saying, uh, if mama ain't happy, what? Ain't nobody happy, right? But because they're going to make it miserable for everybody else. Um, and it's kind of what happened here. Um, they cut their nose off to, to spite their face. Um, they make it their mission to make sure everyone else is miserable. It only started with one, probably, or a handful. And soon, nobody would drink the water because it was bitter. And this is where bitterness is our enemy. It's why it says in Hebrews, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Many were defiled there. And, and it's what Jesus is talking about in Luke eleven thirty four when he says the eye is the lamp of the body. It, it's the lamp of the soul. What we see, what, what leads us, determines what's inside of us. So don't let your circumstances steal your hope. Don't let your circumstances make you bitter. And this is more than, than a glass is half full or half empty thing. That, that's just people's temperament a lot of times. Um, no, a root of bitterness is caused when we are hurt, when we are made to suffer, when we're made vulnerable. And it changes who God meant us to be. It's like the ivy on a house. Um, we did a house, uh, it was years ago, and the guy ended up being my, my Greek professor later. But in the back of his house, um, it had ivy growing all over it. And it was a back room, and, and the plaster was coming off, and we were there doing windows and some siding. And um, he said, well, can you guys get this out and put a new drywall up? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so we were there, we went out, and we started pulling the, um, the, the paneling off, the plaster and the lath, when we noticed behind it, the ivy that was growing on the outside of the house. The roots of the ivy had come into the house. It pulled siding away from studs. You could actually see daylight from inside. You couldn't see it from the outside because of the ivy. But once the, the lath came off, and where there should have been insulation between the walls, there was ivy and roots all over. It had destroyed that room. And we had to do a lot of, of, of renovation. Then we had to pull all the roots out. had to pull all the the ivy out if the room was going to be right. This is what happened with Israel. That bitterness, it got in there and, and it, it was destroying them. It destroyed their faith. Man, God was still right there. He was right there in the pillar of smoke. He was right there in, in, in the pillar of fire. God is still in charge. And I don't know where you're at right now, but God is still in charge. All right? He, he is still God. He's not twiddling his thumbs, wondering what he's doing. He's in charge. It destroyed their community. It said they were grumbling one to another. There, there, was, there was no community there. It was toxic. You want to be with a bunch of people that complain all the time? You know, for a lot of people, you could do that at work. Uh, not me, but I mean, I've, I've been in jobs before, but you know. Um, it was toxic. The bitterness, it, it destroyed their identity. Right? They had begun to think that they, they weren't the chosen people. That, that, that they were no different than the Egyptians. And, and that's why God made this statute with them. Um, they, didn't, they didn't grasp their identity. Look, you're a child of God. If you're a believer in this house, you're a child of God. Your identity is still the same. You might be struggling with bitterness. You might be struggling with a loss of hope right now. But you're still a child of God. And don't forget that. And it destroyed who they thought God was. They thought God was merciless at this point. Right? Know this. The walk of faith isn't easy. All right? But, but Christ helps us to suffer well. And that's the difference. Um, God reassured them there that I am the Lord who heals you. There's healing. They lost hope. And they needed healing. But God was there. And he's the God that heals them. Look, bitterness destroys hope. You know, in less than a week, their whole world had changed. They went from having a home to living in a tent. Right? And in one night, ours changed, didn't it? Um, we went from freedom 
relative anyway, to lockdowns, quarantines. Man, I've been quarantined more than I've not been quarantined. I don't like it. <laughs> Mask mandates, restrictions on, on just about everything. Our world changed. They were without any comforts. Anybody here get hit by the derecho? Yeah. Lost electric for I don't know how long. It wasn't like camping, it was worse. <laughs> and their future was uncertain. Uncertainty, right? It'll bring bitterness on quicker than anything. We don't know when the coronavirus madness is gonna end, do we? We lost our, our beloved senior pastor. Rich is coming in and he's a great guy. But the future's uncertain. Look, the, the truth is this. The bitterness is a bigger threat to the church right now than COVID-19. We can't afford to be bitter. We can't afford to lose hope. And we need healing. Look, bitterness isn't something that, um, that just goes away. Bitterness is something that has to be healed. Um, maybe the lockdowns, maybe the restrictions, maybe all this other stuff didn't affect you. I know a lot of people are introverts. Lockdown, hey, I'm good with that. Quarantine, all right, man, sounds like a vacation. You're sick, all right, if that's you, but. Um, or maybe there's this. The Jews went in there already bitter. Their lives were bitter before God redeemed them. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're hurt, your trauma, your past goes a lot deeper. But there's good news, right? I am the Lord who heals you. God wants to heal you from the trauma of your past. God wants to heal you for your future. God wants you to be whole and, and, and he wants you to be complete. This is what he's telling them. Look, I'm the God who heals you. You're not who you used to be. And, and I'm going to make sure of that. And, and, and this is where this is where the tree and the water come into play. So what, was the water bitter or, or were they bitter? They were both bitter. They never tasted it. The water had a reputation. Like some of us, right? Have a reputation. This is where they come in, the water and the tree. The text says that Moses prayed and the Lord showed him a certain tree. Some say um, a piece of wood. Now the text says, um, the Babylonian and the Assyrian texts, they say that, that Moses wrote the name Yahweh on the tree, the name of God on the tree, and, and then he chucked it into the water. And when he did, the waters were healed and they became sweet. They drank it, their, their hope was restored, and, and they went on with their journey. This is kind of what's called a, an, an allegory or, or a living parable. God can heal you just like he healed the water. God can take your bitterness and make it sweet just like he did that water. And God used a tree to heal. God used a tree to restore hope. So how do we apply this? What do we do with this? Number one, put Jesus in you. You know, whether Moses did or, or didn't write Yahweh on the tree, that, that's not important, right? <laughs> because no tree, no piece of wood, nothing they had access to at that time could make salty water sweet. It's impossible. Salt, salt, eva or salt dissolves in the water quickly, and, and it bonds on a molecular level, on a chemical level. It, it's very hard to desalinate water and, and make it palatable. But God used a tree to do this. Nothing, James says that, that can a, a fresh spring produce salt water? Can a, a salt spring produce fresh water? No, because it's impossible. Only God can separate salt and water. Only God can change the nature of things. Only God can change the nature of people. The saltiness and, and the bitterness. Man, that's the sin in our lives. That, that, that's the things we're ashamed of, the things that have happened to us. But God can separate that. He's the only one who can. As far as the, the east is removed from the west, I will remove your sins 
and, and cast them out and remember them no more. They'll be at the bottom of the ocean. Only God does that. But he won't do that unless God is in you. So God used a tree to heal the waters. God used the tree in the form of a cross to heal you. Take it to Jesus. Jesus said it like this. Whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit, God abiding in you. Are you putting Jesus in you? You're getting your word, prayer, meditation, whatever it does that, that fills your Jesus quote, are you doing that? Maybe you don't know Jesus at all. And if that's you at home, I'll invite you to, to reach out to Lindsay, our, our host. Ask her how, how you can make that happen and, and she'll guide you through it. What else? Stop complaining and start praying. Right? And, and this is, y'all probably already got that. The people that were there were, were, were complaining. They were grumbling to one another. They're grumbling to the wrong people. Because people can't fix your bitterness, right? Moses prayed, they complained. They should have taken it to Moses. He was the intercessor there. He was a type of Christ to them. He, he guided them to, to salvation, to the promised land. He, he was the intercessor from God to them. He was a type of Christ. We've got the real deal, the Christ. Take it to him. Maybe you can't help complaining. Complain to him because a lot of times he's the only one that can fix it anyway. Complaining to one another doesn't help. And when Moses did pray, what, what did God do? He showed him something that was accessible. It was right there. It was something he could do. And, and he did it. There was an obedience there. And God came through. Remember what God has already done, right? This happened three days after the, the parting of the water, after God delivered them from, from an Egyptian army that was going to crush them. And they saw it with their eyes, but they forgot about this. They, they were singing praises to God. Miriam led the women in dancing with tambourines and everything. But now three days, three days. And, and this bitterness has set in and, and their hope is gone. Remember what God has already done. Look, they were already redeemed. But part of the redemption process is healing. They still needed that. If you're a child of God here today, remember, you are redeemed. Get on with the healing. Get those old ivy roots out. God didn't save them so they could die in the desert. And God didn't save you to die bitter and hopeless. No. God redeems us for a purpose. God heals us so we can be whole, so we can be complete, and we can fulfill that purpose. Follow his commands. So, he healed the water. And then he, he gave a, a mandate, a statute. If you listen to me, if you follow my mandates and do what is right in my eyes, um, none of these diseases will, will fall on you. None of these things that, that, that come on the Egyptians. So this is the old covenant. And the old covenant was in place for one purpose, to bring Christ to the world. This people had been preserved as a remnant throughout the entire Old Testament. Why? So that Jesus could come through them. It was the promise given to Isaac that through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, right? What did Jesus say? He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Not an additional commandment, but a new commandment. And in this commandment, 
all the Ten Commandments are wrapped up in. We are bound by love. So follow what he says, follow the commandments. Be active in loving people. Man, if you're stuck in bitterness, if you're stuck in hopelessness, be a blessing to somebody else. That, that's the bottom line here. That, that's what Moses did. You might be the miracle that somebody else is looking for. I mean, if God used a tree, God can use you. Amen? If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Sorry, I had to put that in there. <laughs> you can be someone else's miracle. Yeah, I got to be honest with you. It was already a, a bad year, and then the derecho hit. And uh, I walked outside, and I was like, holy cow, this is bad. Hope was gone. Um, I went through a little bitter phase. How could God do this? Um, but then I was like, oh man, I can fix this stuff. So we started doing that and it's hard to find people that'll climb on a roof, um, especially steep ones. Um, I will, but I don't like to do it by myself in case I fall and someone that, hey, call the ambulance or something. You know, <laughs> so we started a, a operation disaster. Went to a, the trailer park to, to fix some of Joy's curtain. <laughs> and as I looked around, like, holy cow, man, these, man, these trailers, what are these people going to do? Winter time's coming. Um, yeah, I prayed, uh, prayed in her, in her driveway. There's still a burnt mark there. God and he said you can fix this you can get people to help fix this it was right there it was a tree right he put God's name on it he showed it to me right there but I don't know where you're at right now if you're hopeless if you're feeling bitter be a miracle to somebody else. That did more for me than it probably did for any of those people. I needed that. I needed to get out of that funk. And, and that's what did it. And we're all different. Right? But love people. It's a cure for bitterness. It's a cure for hopelessness. And not just you. For them. So God used a certain tree. To bring back hope. So we all know it's the, the first week of Advent. And um, so I, I did all my, my, my sermon like work ahead of time. But for somehow, and some reason, I always end up writing it again on Sunday or Saturday. It happens every Saturday. I'm going down to the basement. Y'all leave me alone. I won't come out till I'm done. I actually do come out to eat and stuff. But. <laughs> so I'm down there and I hear stuff moving around and people are down there dragging stuff out and I was like, oh dang, man, they're sitting up for Christmas already. Um, <laughs> and Christmas is, um, I don't know, it, for me it's not that big a deal. I, but I know it is for, for everybody else. And I come up to, to eat and, and Kat's like, well, you need to get the Christmas tree up here. Where are we going to put it at? And I was like, well, we don't need a Christmas tree. We got the banana tree here. Let's just decorate Nom Nom up, right? He's like nine foot tall, you know. And like, now, mind you, he, he suffered bad during the ratio. I mean, leaves are all shredded. He'll get better, but it's. And by the way, Nom Nom, it's, it's just easier than saying California Gold Dwarf Nom Wah. All right, so he's Nom Nom. Um, but well, no, that, that's not that's not a Christmas tree. That's just that's the banana tree. And, and look at him, he's ugly. He is. I mean, yeah. I went back downstairs and, and these words in here, they, they, they stuck on me. God used a certain tree. A, a banana tree isn't really even a tree, it's, a, it's actually a herb. Um, yeah, I know, fully useless information. 
There is a certain tree. It's a Christmas tree. And it's a Christmas tree because Christ is on it. So, so this year, the season of Advent, and I don't know if you're putting up a tree or not. I hope you are. Don't be a, like me and try and substitute a banana tree. Put God on that tree. All right, let that tree represent hope. Because that's what God used that tree for all those years ago in the desert. To a people who were hopeless, the tree brought hope. Every time you look at it, there's hope. Because look, it takes a while to get bitterness out. It takes a while for, for hope to stick. It, it did for the, the people of Israel. God reminds them constantly. He constantly, remember what I did. He shows them miracles. And it is prophecy. This is our reading for, for this um this first week in Advent, it's Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with the justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Though it might be rough right now, but there is coming a time when Jesus will reign. There'll be no derechos, there'll be no COVID. We'll live in peace. Amen? Let's hope on that. That's my message for today. Let me pray for you. And then Jay's gonna come up or Lindsay, somebody's gonna do announcements. All right. Lord, I thank you for this word. And Lord, it's an it's a easy thing to say, and, and it's harder to live out. Lord, drive us to our word. Drive us to you. Let us not forget who we are. We are yours. We've been bought with a price. Lord, help us to heal. And Lord, above all this, help us to hope. Lord, you've got great plans in store. You're not done with us. You weren't done with, with the Israelites. Lord, help us bank on that. And Lord, as we put our trees up this year, and as they stay up all month, help them to remind us that you used a tree. And there it is, a Christmas tree. It's got Christ at the beginning. Lord, we love you so much, and we ask you these things in Jesus' name.